program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Well, after an absence of quite a while, we're being blessed with elephants all around in the reserve today. And uh, isn't this exciting? They're a mere feat from us. This is Safari Live. Welcome, welcome to this, the Sunset Safari. Aren't we lucky? Elephants, elephants everywhere. After some time with no elephants around at all, I'm absolutely ecstatic to have seen elephants both on the sunrise and the Sunset Safari. Now, it is an interesting day and as those ellies move off, there's some still a bit closer on the left, so... There we go, there they are. It's a big female, just see her bottom sticking out. So I'm going to try and move a little bit closer. There we go. Let's try and get a bit closer. Now, my name is Brent Leo Smith, for those of you who don't know. And uh, today, very exciting for him, we've got Craig on interview. So this is his first time ever doing live. How's it going? There we go, there's Craig. So first time ever doing live, he was sitting on the back with us this morning. So as we like to do here, right into the deep end. Uh, remember, this is 100% live and uh, right around this very bush, there is a massive elephant cow. There she is. Hello, madam. Are you enjoying that young Ledwood sapling? Now remember, if you want to ask us any questions, use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or send us an email to questions at wildearth.tv. It is a sweltering 91 Fahrenheit, 33 degrees Celsius, and uh, the elephants look like they've had a good mud bath through the day. You can see all the mud covering on their skin. And at the moment now, with those massive air conditioning systems installed, those ears of theirs, uh, they're out moving away from the water holes for a bit of a feed. Now, a big cow like this probably eats close on 400 pounds of vegetable metal in a day. She probably weighs around six or 7,000 pounds. So she is a, a, a massive animal. Not quite nearly as big as the big bulls. We can hear some thunder way off in the distance. There's a big storm building to the southwest of us, but will it reach us? I don't know, will Steph Vinterboer's deluge of a hundred mils finally come. We will have to wait and see. Hello, big girl. Now, the majority of the herd has moved off into some thickets further to the west of us. Uh, we're not going to chase around after them. I think I heard some more elephants down towards the Galago Pan. So we might be lucky and catch some still a splishing and a splashing. Now, of course, I'm not the only one out here in the African bush. And even there's even someone who's mad enough to wander around in the heat on foot. So let's go say hello to Taylor. Good afternoon, Brent. You are so hysterical. Now, of course, welcome to, a, hopefully, it's going to be a wonderful sunset safari this afternoon. I'm not sure if we're going to get a sunset or not because the clouds are rolling in thick. Now, of course, my name is Taylor McCurdy and on camera with me this afternoon is Viam and we are being watched over by, of course, the mighty Rexon. So he's just up ahead. You may see him occasionally. Now, I've been thinking hard and long all day. What are we going to do this afternoon? And we always stop and we look at all the lovely flowers and the insects and the beautiful plants and the grasses. Well, and anything interesting, if there's any carcasses, we'll have a little examine about them. But today, what we are going to do 
is we are going to do an, a bumble. We do bumbles in the vehicles all the time when we cruise down the Milwaukee, do a, a real sunset cruise. And well, we're going to do a walking sunset cruise this afternoon. We're really just going to appreciate nature at its best. And hopefully, one of the things I'm also going to be looking out for is any fresh tracks of any animals. And perhaps we can do a little tracking experiment. I know there's some elephants in the area, so maybe we're actually in the area. They're a bit far behind us. So down that way, but they seem to be moving a little bit further west. We might even catch up with them, and who knows? Now, we're actually walking in one of my favorite areas. There's a lot of marula trees, a lot of bush willows, a lot of cluster leaves, and well, look what I've found. Like I said, one of my favorite trees, the marula tree. We've been looking at all the unripe fruits. But in case you are a new viewer and you're not sure what a marula tree is, stay in because I'm sure I'll find a nice big one this afternoon, maybe I'll climb it, who knows. But finally, this is what the fruit is going to start to look like when it gets ripe, it's going to go this yellow color. This one, however, not good to eat, it'll be a very bitter. Now, I believe Jamie Patterson is out and about driving around, so let's go say good afternoon to her. And a very good afternoon to all of you and welcome on the Sunset Safari. My name is Jamie and this afternoon I have a Kenan on camera with me who is doing his interview. So I think you'll all join me in welcoming him into this particular interesting and very exciting experience. Oh, it's wonderful to be back from Neve and what a wonderful sighting to start off with. Then with a herd of zebra with one a tiny little, not, not new new little zebra foal, but a very young zebra fall still trying to oh no don't go mom I was about to say trying to suckle from mom mom's not having any of it though and she's just shepherded the little one away and behind some other zebra oh there we go might pop back out there we go hello little one you're a nice way to start off my sunset safari on my first drive back from leave and it is lovely to be back and driving the properties of Juma, Cheetah Plains and Arethusa. And thank you to all of you sending through your welcomes back. It is wonderful to be back. It is so lovely to see all of these fantastic creatures once again and to come back to a place that has been home for the last year and a half is very special. And whenever I go on leave, it's always a bittersweet sort of feeling because you get the break, but at the same time, you miss these special little moments. I mean, how enormous are those little zebra foals ears? It just look too big for its body. They are so sweet. I'll just bear with me one second. Brent's trying to get hold of me. Um, here. <laughs> I've only been back five minutes. Hold on a second. Brent's trying to get hold of me on the Game Drive channel. So you can watch these lovely zebra while I chat to him. Oh, look at the scar on that zebra's bottom. Uh, standing by, Brent. Are oh, you breaking up a little bit? I think you asked where I came on to Gary Main Weaver's Nest. Look at that. That zebra has definitely had a fortunate escape with some kind of very nasty injury. Sorry, Brent just wanted to know where I was and what my route was. Okay, copy that. Um, yeah, we came through quite quickly. I'm just trying to beat the storm there and back. I'm just letting Brent know that I raced along Gowrie Main, trying to get to Cheetah Plains to see what's happened to those cheetah that FW had there this morning before the storm hits, and we have to go racing back once again. But back to our stallion zebra, and it is the stallion of this herd. You can tell by the thin stripe uh, underneath his tail, between the cheeks of his bottom, and that is one of the clearest indicators that the zebra that you're looking at is a male. Now you can see that that was a really, really nasty injury that has formed a scar. It's obviously healed up completely, he's perfectly fine now. But that was deep. You can see the, the way that, that that injury has sort of fallen, healed with a, a slight concave effect. Now that is an injury that wasn't just a, a superficial skin scratching. That's actually gone right down into the muscle. And that could have come from a, diff a couple of different things. That could have been a lucky escape from lions, although I'm hesitant to say that, just judging by the directions that that scar goes or travels in. I think that might have been another male zebra, particularly because this is a stallion. 
though he could well have been fighting with another male zebra. Ouch. It just goes to show the incredible resilience of these animals. And for those of you that perhaps for whom this is the first drive that you have gone on, that's something you'll learn about, well, I suppose all animals in general, but particularly the ones that we see out here. We occasionally see them with the most horrific injuries, and yet somehow injuries that would, that would put human beings in hospital without any question. And yet somehow they manage to fight off infection, fight off the injury, and heal up perfectly. It is a beautiful afternoon. What a lovely afternoon to be back out here. It's not too hot. It is warm, but it's not too hot. The storm is coming, hopefully fingers crossed, because of course we could always use more rain. And Kellen and I have the exciting opportunity of heading across towards Cheetah Plains. Good question coming through from Justin. And Justin, good afternoon to you and welcome to the Sunset Safari. You wanted to know how many pounds a zebra can give off with one single kick. Because of course they are very fierce, or they can be very fierce creatures, and between the bites and the kicks that they will, um, that they can actually give off, they are very, very powerful. You want to know how many pounds? I have no idea. I'm, I'm at a loss as to how to answer your question. I'm not quite sure. I would go around the, the sort of the same amount of force that a horse could give off in its kick, um, but I'm not how, what sort of I'm not sure what sort of pressure per square inch a zebra would manage to convey with one kick. Those of you perhaps with Google at your fingertips, perhaps you could let me know, and you can as always send that through on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv and let's see if we can get an answer. I can tell you I've been bitten by a zebra before, and it is a thoroughly unpleasant experience. Those two little falls are so sweet. Zebra, despite their relatively placid appearance, can be unbelievably aggressive animals, particularly for little foals like the ones that we've been looking at that have now completely disappeared behind the leaves. Um, I've seen a zebra foal mistake on several occasions. Oh, there we go. There's some more zebra. I've seen zebra foals in the past mistake one zebra mare for their mothers, and the amount of aggression that is shown when they do do that is severe. They get, despite the fact that they're just tiny little things, they get bitten and kicked. And these two are having a little bit of a, a tiff. Not a serious tiff. If it was serious, we'd know about it. They bite and they kick very painfully. And these two are just nudging each other and pushing each other out of their way. And there's always constant little squabbles within a zebra harem. And welcome to Ed on our sunset safari, whilst our zebra play hard to get um, behind the trees, giving us a perfect demonstration of their stripes. Ed, earlier on we saw that stallion with his injury, and oh, there we go, there's one on the left. Um, earlier on we saw that zebra stallion with his massive scar. And you wanted to know if there is only one dominant zebra stallion per herd. Yes, essentially. Um, although, of course, you can get multiple zebra herds gathered together to make one large herd. Um, sort of along the lines of there's always safety in numbers. But what will happen out here is that a zebra stallion will gather a herd together. So he will have his harem. It's known as a harem. Um, just, you know, like um, there are certain harems in certain cultures or in historical times. Um, he has his harem and he is the dominant stallion and he'll have a collection of mares and within that harem there will also be a very strict hierarchy. So his oldest and most familiar mare or female zebra, she will be the top of the hierarchy, she will be the one that walks at the front of the line, and she makes sure that she sort of maintains her status by severe kicking and biting if any of the other females become brazen enough to try and shove past her. And then it will sort of go in descending order of rank depending on when the females joined that particular herd. So yes, um, you will also find bachelor herds of zebra. So you don't necessarily find just the breeding herds. You'll also find bachelor herds of young males that have decided that there's always safety in numbers, but they haven't yet gained the strength or the experience to have gathered their own harem. And within those zebra bachelor herds, there will be a certain degree of hierarchy. Oh, they're all over the show this afternoon. They're all coming back once again. 
um, there will be a certain hierarchy where the older stallions will probably take the top spot. Let me try and re... Oh, no, we're all galloping now. Where are we all going? Disappeared. They're a little bit skittish. I wonder if it's not the storm building in the air. Let me try and reposition for one more view. Let's try and get a little bit closer. I'm very interested to hear the answer to Justin's question as well about the kicking power of a zebra. That would be fascinating to know. Hold on a moment. Let's try for one last view. They might have vanished, but let's try. Zebbies? Where did you go? Are oh, they playing hide and seek? Which they do very well with those stripes. No, I can see them walking off into the distance. They've changed direction once again and they're on their way into Chitwa, which is south of our boundary, unfortunately, so where we can't follow. So while Kellen and myself race off towards Cheetah Plains, which we're going to do now, let's head back over to Brent to find out what his plans for the afternoon are. Oh, oh shade. My plan is to sit in the trade of the shade of this wonderful weeping wattle for the next while. Of course, I'm joking. I'm actually, after seeing those elephants be covered in mud, I'm really hoping we can find another herd of elephants, but covering themselves in mud. So I want to find some playing. So I'm heading down, checking all the major water holes and mud wallows, also stopping in every little bit of convenient shade as we go. But also, you can see, if we go pan up to the horizon, you can see we're living dangerously. We are heading straight south towards the dark, stormy clouds. But we are hoping that there are going to be some elephants at Twin Dams. Hello, Lane. Lane is wondering where the tailless elephant I had to give a lesson in good manners to this morning uh, has gone. Oh, I'm not sure. I wouldn't mind bumping into him again. Maybe he needs, he's had his morning classes. Maybe he needs his afternoon classes and good behavior around safari vehicles. But uh, he could be anywhere on Juma. He could have walked all the way through to Arethusa already, we don't know. His general direction was to the west, so towards Arethusa. Oof, it is warm. Well, I suppose it's not as hot as is, as it is really humid today. So hopefully, fingers crossed, we are going to get a bit of rain later. Now, Taylor has got something with leaves on it to show you. Not the most difficult thing to find, seen as though, well, they grow everywhere. Now, we were chatting about marula trees earlier, and I showed you, of course, the, the fruit of a marula tree, though they're not ripe just yet. And, well, they shouldn't really be dropping off. I don't think they're going to taste very nice. I'm sure with a lack of water we've had, they'll be exceptionally bitter. Now, you had my favorite animal with Brent, a beautiful herd of elephants, which is wonderful. We might even catch up with them, hopefully. But I just wanted to show you how strong elephants really are. So, and we've shown you this a number of times of how elephants like to feed on the bark. We see it in the winter months. You can see that they have completely stripped away at all the bark here, feasting on the cambium layer, which is the layer where all the nutrients are transported from the roots all the way to the tops of the leaves, which allows them, of course, to grow and develop. Looks easy, don't you think? I'm going to now demonstrate how tough the bark actually is. Which knife are we going to use? Let's go for a smooth one. Now, it's it's really hard to understand unless you're here and you're actually feeling the tr and you can actually feel the tree. But watch this. Let's go to this side. Look, yeah. 
I'm going to try and stab this knife as hard as I can into the tree. Now, if you're a young child and you are watching this, please do not try this at home. And uh, it's just, I'm just demonstrating, of course, and I've got VM here, he's watching me. He's told me I'm not allowed to cut my fingers or anything like that, so we'll be very careful. So I'm gonna try and push this knife as far into the tree as I can. I'll probably end up breaking the knife. That's it. That is as far as the tip of that blade goes in. It's probably, well, the length of your thumbnail. Not very deep, and I hit that really, really hard. But now watch. Yeah. There's absolutely no way that I can pull this knife down into the tree. I can pull it out and I made the tree bleed. Sorry tree, it'll be all right though. I didn't, I didn't completely wreck the, the cadmium layer so it's not gonna stop the nutrients from transporting. But come and have a look. I can't do that and I'm using all the force that I have. But VM, look at this. I'm just gonna pull this up. How incredible is that? That an elephant has taken its tusk, pushed it into the bark, and most likely pulled down, or even started at the bottom, maybe actually starting down here, sticking its tusk in, and completely ripping it through that tree, much <laughs> we're now stuck underneath a, um, a bush willow. Um, but I just think that that's amazing, that the strength of these animals, that they're able to do something like that, it just makes us as humans look really sort of small and puny and pathetic, really. I had a knife. Elephants don't have knives, but I could not do anywhere near the damage that the elephants are capable of doing. I just think that's amazing. And look, it looks like they've been painting and drawing. It looks like a U. I don't know what letter that would be. But they love feasting on this. But now that it is coming into the summer months and all the trees have got their lovely nice green leaves on them, finally the bark is taking a little bit of a break at the moment and it's important. That's why we're so good to have these rainy seasons because it allows the vegetation to regenerate all over again. But now I think we're going to Brent. I think Brent has got a giant, not a giant, but a rather large kudu, kudu bull to show you. Well, not quite a giant yet, but a nice kudu bull. And if we look carefully on the twists of his incredible Kirk corkscrew horns, look at that. Look at the mud there. Now that's to make him look more impressive if he has to joust with the other kudus. See, my horns are bigger, even though it's all pretend and they're just covered in mud. Quite a few different animal species will do that. Uh, Inyala, bushbuck, uh, obviously kudu, as well as wildebeest. So we've obviously all gone for a drink. As I said, we're checking the water holes at the moment, but now they're finished drinking. The water holes are in the blazing sun and they're heading for a little bit of shade. Kudu is the largest of the Trafalagus family we get here in South Africa. Of course, an eland is part of the Toro Tragus family. So they are cousins, but not quite the same close relation. Now, I've got a question for you guys. What is the biggest member of the Trafalagus in terms of heaviest, biggest uh, Trafalagus antelope in the world? If you know the answer, remember hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can use the email address questions at wildearth.tv. Now, some of you might have noticed that I've popped my collar this afternoon. And uh, when you pop your collar out in the bush, it's not to be one of those preppy, um, not a nice word following preppy. Uh, uh, what, what, I think, what are they? Sorority, not sorority, what's the opposite? Well, anyway, I can't remember now. Uh, but fraternity boys, there we go, thank you, Kirsten. Sorority is the girls, although the fraternity boys are a bit like sorority girls. Um, but there we go, so my collar is popped because I cut my hair and I don't want to get a sunburn on the back of my neck. So it's not a fashion statement, it's a practical sta reason, and that's strange enough why collars were first made. I think a lot of people have forgotten that, that collars were there to protect you from the sun, not to make you look suave. Oh yeah, a bit of cloud cover. Well, Kirsten thinks I look suave, uh, but then again, We've got to worry about Kirsten's taste. Uh, 
Okay, so my plan is I've checked around Twin Dams. I'm now going to head towards Buffalo's Hook, and I'm, as I said, I'm hoping to find some elephants wallowing in the mud. Uh, it could be quite nice. But uh, while we get there, we might find all sorts of fascinating things along the way, like human beings. Okay, so I think we might have forgot to tell you this, Craig, when we drive up to another vehicle, it's best to just pan off to the side. Sorry, uh, we did forget to mention that to you. There we go. How's it, how's it? Very well yourself. How are you guys doing? Merry Christmas. Compliments of the season. Are you, uh, not much in Vietella except for Ellie's on Gallagher Shortcuts. Buffalzok, yeah. Yeah, Buffalzok at Hardacore. Oh. Uh, no, Jamie's already on her way. I'm going to go bumble around. Enjoy. Cheers, guys. Don't worry about that. There's my morning. I mean, morning. I'm getting confused. It's the afternoon meeting. Okay. Oh dear, David. David said the largest spiral horned antelope or trafalegid is a wildebeest. Uh, a wildebeest is actually not related to the spiral horned antelope. So uh, the spiral horned antelope that occur in the Sabi Sands, Inyala, Kudu, Bushbuck. Am I forgetting one? Inyala, Kudu, Bushbuck. Oh, and possibly uh, Toro Tragus, which is a cousin, which is Eland. And the only, there are five in Southern Africa, and the one that is not occurring in South Africa is the Sutatunga. But a wildebeest is actually part of the Conatchus family, which is the heart of beasts uh, and that lot. So not part of the spiral horned antelope. And the largest trafalegid does not occur in Southern Africa. There's another clue for you. Hello Donna. Donna, no it is not a moose, uh, a moose is not even an antelope, a moose is a deer. So one of the main differences between deer and antelope is antelope's horns uh, will fall off every season. So they grow every season and fall off, where there is an antelope has bone inside its horn and once it breaks it will not grow back. So uh, you don't get any antelope in North America. Uh, antelope you get in Africa and I'm trying and and actually in the in Iran Arabia Let's see if they land that's bad light Let's have a look where you're going to land was there one that's landed there we go So you see that small fallen tree there just watch my finger follow it to the point of my finger Oh Did he fly no no come back out? So come out a little bit out a little bit just so I can get my hand in there. There we go keep coming Okay, keep coming. Zoom in here. Keep zooming. There, right where my finger is. There's a European bee eater. Here we go. Hello, pretty birdie. Now, I've seen one car mine so far this season, but unfortunately it disappeared too quickly before we could get a camera in it. But for those of you who know, the European beaters have migrated from the south of France, Spain, Portugal, come to take advantage of all our insects out here. Very pretty birds. You can hear there's quite a few around them. You hear that. Now they get their name Bee Eater because they do occasionally catch stinging insects, wasps, and bees. But before eating them, to make sure they do not do them any damage, they beat them against a stick. I could actually hear one doing it somewhere. You said that. There we go. I don't know if you can just hear it in the distance. This one is not catching anything. Oh, it's going to be joined. A little bit lower down. Look at that golden back. There we go. There's one in nice full colors. Look at that beautiful golden back. Absolutely gorgeous, aren't they? Now you can see how it's constantly checking around for any flying insects to feast upon. There you go. You can see it calling. Jerup, jerup, jerup. Oh, off they go. Okay, well, wonderful. Now, it's not, as I said, it's not always about the big hairies and scaries. Sometimes it's about the birds and the bees. 
Now, while on foot, you're often able to find some incredible small things. So let's see if Auntie Taylor has got her magnifying glass out today. As VM describes what we've just stumbled across, he's used the word minefield, which is quite interesting. Now, if you listen very carefully, you should hear a buzzing. Can you hear the buzzing? Zzz, like a helicopter really. Now there's a couple of spider hunting wasps flying around. Well, what used to be a massive termite mound, as you can see, not tall, but sort of width-wise, it was really big. And there's quite a few burrows here with lots of different entrances. So I think what's happened is aardvark and of course the warthogs have come through here and utilized the site as a den site. And of course many, many tunnels joining with lots of different exits. None of the tunnels however, they don't look very active anymore so I'm quite comfortable standing around here. But you can see, if you look over there, look how it's collapsed. Obviously it got quite weak with all the tunnel systems and, and this looks very, very old. And that's what happens is that sometimes if you're driving around and you're off-roading and you don't realize that you've got a termite mound underneath you, it's not a particularly tall one, and a warthog or an aardvark has come through and made all these tunnels underneath the ground, it can collapse underneath your wheels and you don't want that to happen, especially if you've got guests on the vehicle. But now something that I was wondering is that every time we're at a termite mound, we always see wasps especially the spider hunting wasps, particularly around uh, an entrance like this. This is obviously not an entrance to the termites, uh, but of course for either a warthog, uh, even something small like a jackal may use it as a den. But what I'm really curious about is because they go in and out all the time, I've even seen them going inside with caterpillars. Now we know the spider hunting wasps, we get the great big metallic blue ones which are the most common, and then occasionally we see ones with orange wings and black bodies too of various sizes of course. Now I wonder, and I don't know how true this is, I'm just, just thinking out of the box here. Wasps will dig holes into the ground, burrows, where they will lay their eggs and they'll often, obviously they'll either lay their eggs on a host, like a caterpillar or a spider, any one of those things really, and then they close the top of the, of the tunnel up. Now I wonder if they don't go into these abandoned termite mounds which are no longer active and utilize the tunnels that the termites have already created. Because it's a perfect tunnel, straight hole, all they need to do is deposit their eggs on, onto their host, leave, and then put a thin layer of mud or sand or something just to close up that hole. Now, I don't know how true it is, I'm gonna have to have a little chat. I was just thinking as we were standing here, why do we keep seeing the spider hunting wasps? Maybe it's also because the sand is nice and soft in some parts, especially over here, you can see, look at it. It's not particularly difficult to dig down over here. But on a big termite mound, of course, when they make those big sort of mountains, that bakes in the sun, and that's quite hard. But like I said, this is a very old one. It's completely deteriorating now. Have you seen a wasp? Yes, the orange one. Is now, it's so difficult to try and get a wasp on camera. Oh, I can hear, hear. We're trying to find the blue one. It's flying around us. I think it's going to go in the inside. I'm glad you can hear it. So that zzz that you're hearing buzzing around my head, it's one of those big spider hunting wasps. We're gonna see if we can get it. There it is. See, it's gone the other side. Let's take a little walk. Yeah, it's gone. Oh, no. It's playing games with us. Come back. Come back, spider hunting wasp. I don't know how to lure a spider hunting wasp in either. I've never ever tried to coax one. Obviously, sometimes you do that. Jamie does it very well to coax the mongoose, the dwarf mongoose, to coming out. But I don't know if there's any techniques to get a wasp to come over to you. Perhaps I'll have to pretend to be a caterpillar or a spider. Oh my goodness, Jamie has got something very exciting to show you. So let's head straight over to her. Oh, he's just about to disappear off into the vegetation, but we've just come around the corner and surprised this massive bull hippopotamus that was in three in a row pan. And he was hidden behind a termite mound, so I didn't see him as I came around the corner. And he got a little bit of a fright. And of course, most of the time, hippo generally will feel far more comfortable um, on in the water than they will on land. Let's see if we can get... I don't really want to scare him, shame. 
um, they'll generally feel more comfortable in water but because there's so little water around and because the drought has hit these animals so hard I don't want to pressurize him in any way because he obviously didn't feel safe enough to stay in the water as we came around the corner and he's got up and he's moved into the dense vegetation sorry boy I didn't know you were there you took me completely and utterly by surprise the massive bulk of one of, in, in theory, one of Africa's most dangerous animals. Um, and I did make sure as soon as he came out of the water that we reversed back a little bit to give him some space to move away. Hey boy, sorry about that. He's looking better though. Um, our hippos have been through such an incredibly rough time over the last few months. And now that we've had the rain that we have had, and we've got the grass growth, they're slowly but surely starting to recover, which is an absolute pleasure to see. Let's see if he'll, let's go forward a little bit, try for one last view. Ah, oh, no, he's still moving off, very much intent on putting space between us and him. Sorry, boy. No, he's gonna disappear. I can just see the shining skin of his back. Now, if I had known that he was there, I probably would have done a little bit of a detour around the water's edge. Now, typically when dams are full and life is easy for the hippo, when there's a lot of water, they are perfectly wonderful animals and they're perfectly relaxed um, around people and around vehicles at the water's edge. And actually, he's got, he was in here. He was hidden, by the way, behind that termite mound that I once saw quarantine on. No quarantine today. Quarantine is a male leopard, by the way. He was in here, and typically that would be fine for a hippo to feel relatively comfortable, but it is so shallow that he obviously felt as though he was under threat and he didn't feel safe at all. Shame. Sorry, hippo. Although, apparently, Cheetah Plains has received quite a lot more rain than Juma has, and by the looks of things, it is about to receive more. Now I wanted to race across to where the cheetah were last seen and I'm actually going to keep moving because if you look at what's coming, um, I think, oh, there's thunder too. How wonderful, we're going to get a proper summer storm. However, um, we're about to get caught in the middle of it. So I think we need to race across to the open area, check for the cheetah and then race back again. I'm not even sure I should be carrying on. I'm driving straight into the storm. Let's see how we go. And welcome to Lionheart, who wants to know if it's unusual to see a hippo out of the water in the middle of the day, or if he just ran because of the vehicle. Uh, to be completely 100% honest with you, he ran because of the vehicle. He got a fright. I got a fright. Well, not a fright. I got a surprise. Um, he was very, very well hidden behind the edge of the water. I didn't know he was there. Um, so he did get a fright. But you do see hippo out of water. Typically not on a day like today. It's very, it's still very, very hot. The storm hasn't properly hit yet. So it's still blisteringly hot in the sun. And that's generally the time that the hippos will spend in the water because they've got sensitive skin. However, when they are hungry, when they're really very hungry, what we've seen over the last few months is that they will, even on the hottest day, come out of the water. Right, from something very big to something a lot smaller, let's go and see what feathered friend Brent has for you. Oh, the wind has just started howling, but we've got a male a black-bellied busted. He hasn't been doing his traditional <whistles> pop for us. But it, this is one of the more common areas we do see them displaying. So they actually occur in quite relatively high numbers in this this part of the world you're looking at about two and a half to three males per 100 hectares now the females will be attracted into their calling stations but they won't um, lay their eggs near the calling stations and, and well, a nest is a strong word it's a shallow scrape in the sand but for me one of the coolest things is their defensive posture so quite often when they are 
chase. They will either fly or run before lying flat on the ground. And the predatory species that most commonly go after them are under the mammals, leopard seems to be the most successful with them. Um, possibly caracal or serval, but they are quite big. It's, it's the martial eagles, tawny eagles, who will spell death from above for the black-bellied bustard. <laughs> Look at that. Oh, a little head, head, head bob. I thought we might get some calling all of a sudden. No, it's found some something to eat. So they've got quite a varied diet. They will eat grass seeds, fruits, uh, but mostly made up of insects and things like that. Okay, well, little black belly busted, we're going to move along. See what else the far east holds for us. Well, well done to James and Anita who were spot on on the mammal quiz. Indeed, the biggest member of the Trafalagus family is uh, the bongo. Now quite a few of you might have said eland, as I said an eland is a cousin, it's torotragus. So they do have spiral horns but it's not a trafalagus. So it's not the same family, uh, it's a cousin of. So bongo is the biggest and uh, second biggest, those of you who had mountain in Yala would have been very very close. Okay we do have oh, like elephant tracks crossing towards Buffalo's Hook waterhole. Uh, we're still quite far away, so you never know, maybe some luck. Woo, it's still warm. We had a little bit of cloud. Yo, I didn't I haven't looked behind me for a while, but it is dark and ominous there. Uh, we'll see if we can, once we get up onto the eastern, uh, onto the northern boundary, up on the high ground, we'll have a look at that dark cloud coming in from the south. Well, we're going to keep moving towards Buffalo Hook Waterhole uh, while we do that. It seems like Madam T-Bomb definitely has her magnifying glass out, so let's go see which six-legged creature she's found. We are searching all the shrubs and under all the leaves on our afternoon bumble, but what you are looking at at the moment is an elegant grasshopper. And we've been seeing many, many of them. We started seeing them about a week and a half ago as the tiniest, smallest little nymphs. And well, they keep developing very, very quickly because every time I see one over the last couple of days, they seem to double in size all the time. And that is very, very typical of grasshoppers, is that they can eat their entire body weight in one day. Isn't that crazy? I couldn't imagine eating my entire body weight in one day. And, and that's what makes them one of the most, sort of, well, the largest pests really in the world, are the locusts and the grasshoppers, because they'll go through and destroy thousands and thousands of crops. Now I know the desert locust is probably the most destructive of them all when they swarm over big fields and completely wipe out plantations of cereal crops and maize and all, and all those goodies. But luckily out here they don't seem to cause too much of a problem and I wonder if that's just not because there's so many different things out here that eat them which is good. However, you saw those bright colors, didn't you? Should we see if we can pick it up? Now, I'm not too worried about picking it up. We'll see, but they, come on, go into my hand. Let's see, nope, big jump. <laughs> Actually, that's incredible. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make him fly. VM, are you ready? How cool is that? 
So you saw the bright colors, the yellows, the greens, the reds, and of course the red when it opens its legs and wings and it flies, well jumps and then leaps and flies away. And of course that is flash coloration, so that's to try and deter a predator. If it is on its trail and it's spotted it, they will expose that bright red flash hide again and their camouflage normally blends in and the predator forgets what it initially was looking for and then only starts searching for that bright red flash which of course it won't see unless the grasshopper hops again but what i was saying is that it's brightly colored on the outside and they feed on a variety of different toxic plants and what actually happens is that through their exoskeleton after eating all these poisonous plants is that they're able to utilize the toxins from the plants and turn it into a chemical defense now we were talking a lot about that this morning and one of you were actually asking what are sort of toxic bugs to us. So that's something you probably would not be able to eat. Um, I have picked one up before where you get a little bit of yellow on you and that's the color of this uh, chemical substance that's secreted on you and it doesn't smell very nice. And I haven't tasted it, not brave enough to taste it, but I can only imagine that it wouldn't be very nice inside my mouth. I'd probably have to rinse it out with a glass of water or two. And we were also speaking about the frogs and toads this morning with the parotid glands and of course uh, secreting uh, the bufo toxins. Now when a dog eats a frog that has got a large toxin and if it eats a grasshopper like that, what it will do is it will cause, it will, the dog will salivate quite a, a large amount and often it makes it a bit difficult for them to swallow. Now I heard my radio go, I think it could have been me pressing buttons because I like to press buttons. Ah, right, let's carry on walking. Hello, Alana. You were wondering what the difference between a grasshopper and a locust is. Now, there isn't really too much difference. They're much of a mus muchness, really. Some people say they call them locusts when they swarm, so when they're in big groups, and when they're on their own and sing singular, we call them grasshoppers. But I've looked up different books. Some people call them crested lo not this one, for example, the, the other uh, grasshopper locust that we see that's very camouflaged, it almost looks like a leaf, the, the crested locust. I've also seen them being called crested grasshoppers. I really think it is just much of a muchness really um, there, there shouldn't be any any differences the wings are the same the same amount of legs all those sorts of goodies radio now we're gonna loop back around and perhaps see if those elephants that Brent had earlier are out and about maybe in the open otherwise uh, we'll see what other little critters we can really find but Jamie has finally reached the massive plains of cheetah plains The massive plains of Cheetah Plains and Mala Mala, where apparently the Cheetah Brothers were last seen. And we've arrived to some very dramatic scenery this afternoon. There's some lightning happening in the distance, some rain pouring down over the... Ooh, and some thunder too. Some rain pouring down. Look at that. It is gushing down somewhere south of us. Look at that. That is marvellous to see, especially in the times of drought that we've had. Now, Ashley, welcome to the Sunset Safari. While we watch the storm as the rain pours down onto the thirsty land, you want to know how common it is for lightning to strike an animal. It actually does happen. I wouldn't call it common, but it does happen, particularly with giraffe, which kind of makes sense because they do tend to stick up in the landscape. Often, not so much in the low felt, but in the high felt areas where giraffe have been... Ooh, thunder. Um, where giraffe have been introduced because they do just stick up so much above the landscape and the trees. And the high felt tends not to... Ha tends not to have the sort of the shrubbery that we get here so they can't really shelter but I once actually came across a very grisly scene I was out on walk and I came across a group of I think it was about 10 or so dead impala and one smoldering tree and they'd very clearly been struck the, or at least lightning had struck the tree that they were trying to shelter under. So it does happen. I'm not sure I would call it common. Um, it's not an everyday occurrence, naturally, but it does happen that animals get struck by lightning. And of course, we're also very, very careful. In South Africa, it, lightning is one of those forces that you just don't mess with, not just in South Africa, I think in any part of the world. But we do have very severe thunderstorms. When I was at school, a couple of my contemporaries were actually killed in a storm. 
that struck their tent or lightning that struck their tent. Um, and I know of several incidents of kids on sports fields or even adults on sports fields who have fallen victim to lightning. So it's something we're very careful of. And I'm sitting here now. Um, as soon as I start to hear the lightning coming to within about five kilometers of us is when we put down our antenna, our broadcast antenna, and we start to race for home. It's just that little bit too dangerous for us to be out in lightning. And when I say here that lightning is five kilometers away, I do, of course, mean the distance or the time difference between the flash of lightning and the roll of thunder, because, of course, light travels so much faster than sound. So you can actually gauge the distance that lightning is away from us. But that's beautiful, isn't it? What an extraordinary scene we have in front of us. Absolutely beautiful. It is, isn't it, Bushmum? You say it is a dramatic sky. It is very, very dramatic. It would be even more dramatic if we were to have some cheetah basking in the um, gusting wind, perhaps enjoying the slight drop to the temperature. That would make it even better. But you're right, it is a thoroughly dramatic sky. I mean, that is, those are very, very heavy clouds. And they are on, our, on their way towards us. So I'm going to do one very quick scouring of the southern boundary of cheetah plains. I don't see any sign of the cheetah. But of course, cheetah are daytime animals. They are diurnal hunters, which means that they could at any point have moved away. And of course, while we're in this open area, and always, Aaron in New Zealand, never fear. I'm always keeping an eye out for the jackal that we see occasionally on the side of the world. Um, Kellen, of course, will also be keeping an eye out for the jackal, so it's not just me. We'll see if we can't find them. Right. Are there any cheetah here? There's a bush. There's another bush. There's some small trees. One larger tree. Come on, cheetah. I'm not 100% sure exactly where it was they were, but I have a feeling that we'd see them if they were still in this area. Or at the very least, we'd, have a, we'd see the Mala Mala vehicles gathered around them. And I think it's safe to say that our cheetah have moved off. And on that note, I think perhaps we should too. It is very quiet here on the plains. There is not a jackal, nor cheetah, nor indeed anything. They are all hiding away. And I think that must tell us something, that perhaps maybe there's a storm on its way towards us. Now, whilst we go and see if perhaps the cheetah didn't decide to come north, and let's head across to Brent, who also does not have cheetah. Yes, I don't have any cheetah. Thank you for reminding me, Jamie. At least you have a chance at cheetah down on cheetah plains. Although, strangely enough, the first time I saw cheetah on Juma was just behind Buffalo's Hook waterhole. And they were chased by quarantine male leopard. Now, the elephants have beaten us here. The tracks have come down to the Buffalo's Hook waterhole. And they have already departed. Or it looks like they actually didn't even stop. So it looks like they just came through. Well, there are some birds around. Let's get up onto the dam wall. Ooh. Okay, so here we go. Watch my finger. So zoom in in that area there, a little bit to the left with my fingers. So hang on, let me just check. There we go. Uh, Those Egyptian geese, but a bit down. There we go. On the edge of the water, on the second bit of water, right there. So zoom a little bit to the left. There we go. Aha! There's a nice one for a bird quiz. Oh, is it a bit easy? I think it's a bit easy, but we will do it anyway. Oh, hopefully you're getting some nice screenshots with the beautiful silhouette. So, who knows what bird that is? If you know what bird that is, send your answers through to hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv. So, what we're looking at there, you're looking at the eye, see the white eye stripe, and the yellowish legs are two of the distinguishing features on that little wader who's searching around for little aquatic invertebrates on the edge of the water. 
Now, he's not the only little bird searching for aquatic invertebrates. If we come out to the right a bit, keep going along that patch of water, if you just keep going to the right. A little bit more. Oh, there we go. Center frame now. A little bit to the right. There we go. A very beautiful little three-banded three banded plover. Eight quick moving little chaps. Now we saw a painted snipe here a while ago, which is the first and only painted snipe I've seen since I've been at Safari Live. And quite unusual to find them sitting out in the middle of an open muddy wallow like that. But apart from the resident Egyptian geese, the three banded plover and the, oh, I nearly gave it away, unidentified wader, not much happening here. Oh, actually come out quickly Craig. So right in front of me, over there. So zoom in now, a little bit to the left. There we go, drop a little bit. Aha, uh -huh. down a bit more to the right. There we go. Ooh! Oh, I, I don't know. Final Control gets angry with me when I do two quizzes at once, but it's such a good bird. And look how they're opening their wings like that, and that's to let the cool air pass over uh, the blood vessels underneath. Well, I'm not going to have a quiz. I'm just going to keep quiet for a second so those of you who know it can figure it out. Well, Elena and Vulpine Wolf Girl. Oh, feeding a chick. Guest Sandpiper for the first quiz, but I wanted to know which sandpiper. Can't just say sandpiper. That's like me saying eagle. Doesn't count. Well done to Vulpine, Wolfgo and Raisa who said wood sandpiper. Now I'm going to try to get a little bit closer to these swallows. Now, of course, there are swallows, but which swallow are they? Okay, don't fly away, don't fly away, don't fly away. There we go. Very pretty little swallows. Now, I wonder who can guess what those are. I know I'm going to be in trouble from Kirsten, but it's so fun and we don't get to see them sitting too often. They're normally flying so fast past us, but who knows what swallow species this is. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or questions at wildearth.tv if you can identify which swallow these are. Now, what you're looking at is under the throat is one of the diagnostics and of course they do have the caps over their ears. Now oh, there was a bit of a hint. There was a bit of a hint on how far their dark cap extends down. Oh we can hear thunder behind us. And it says, is it a European swallow? <gasps> That's the one. It is not. It is not. They're much bigger than a European swallow. European swallow has a red throat and a white chest, which these are lacking. I just wish they would turn around for us. Try sneak again a little bit further so you can stay on them. Oh, well, one of our resident birding, birding experts who join us on Safari Live is spot on. It is indeed red-breasted swallows. Now, there's one other swallow you might get confused with, with the red, whoa, off they go, red-breasted swallow. I hate doing this because 
I'm waiting for my phone to come back from the doctor, but here we go. So you can. So what I was talking about is these blue ear covers that extend down the. Here we go down the down over the ears f extending quite far and it's that rufous chest so I'm just going to do this so I can get to the other the other one now the one that you can possibly get confused with is the mosque swallow let me see if I can get a photo but you see there it's got a much paler throat and it does not have those little blue patches down over its ear very cool. Now we do get both here. I have seen both on the drives. So there we go. That's a nice one. And maybe we'll find a mosque swallow just now. Hi, Abigail. Now, Abigail would like to know how to start birding. Well, Abigail, I'm so excited because I love birding and I think we need more bird watchers out there in the world. Now, Abigail would like to know how do I get started. Well, Abigail, well, if you're doing a safari live birding, you're lucky because James, Jamie, myself, Taylor, Steph will do most of the hard work for you. Now, but if you want to bird at home, I suggest the first step is get yourself a pair of binoculars. Uh, and a bird book that covers your local area and just try identify the bird species that are in your garden. Now from what to write down in this case now from that little section we just had there you can write down an Egyptian goose, you can write down a three-banded plover, you can write down a wood sandpiper uh, and you can wipe down a red bested swallow so there we go you've really got a really great start a whole bunch of bird species off the bat so there we go and then I mean some of our viewers are sitting on over 260 species that they've seen alive on drive isn't that absolutely amazing there's a lot of safari guides in the Sabi Sands I wish they'd seen that many here but of course not everyone loves birds as much as we do Okay, so no signs of elephants yet. I might head all the way down towards the west to where that other herd of elephants was heading. Maybe we can catch up with them uh, while we do that. Uh, it seems like Taylor's staring into the sky. We are watching the storm as it rolls on by. And it's just absolutely incredible how we're probably only maybe a maximum of about two miles away from the storm and it's just completely missing us. A couple of dark clouds coming over the top of our heads now, but the real downpour that you were watching with Jamie, we're just seeing it starting to pass now. Probably elephant plains, maybe even a little bit further away, maybe Londolozi side, but all sort of going straight towards the west. Now, we're in a very thick area. So I'm not talking as loud as what I normally do. And we've got to be very quiet around here. You can see we're completely surrounded by trees. Because this is the area where we thought the elephants could have moved into. Now, we've just come to do a little uh, walk about and a little check, of course. There's some beautiful animal pathways here. <sighs> Sorry, I almost ate an insect. But if we do bump into these elephants, it's so important to be aware of your surroundings. Know where there is an escape route. So big trees, big termite mounds, especially termite mounds to give yourself some nice height and um, of course you want to just keep looking around you all the time and we're stopping, we're walking, 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 we stop and we listen, about 30 seconds, sometimes even a minute, just to wait in here if we can hear a branch break or anything like that to give away the elephant's presence, but for the moment, no luck, so we shall continue walking on and see what we find around here. <laughs> the log got, uh, lesser spotted log grabbed VM by the leg there. Hello Cindy, Cindy you were wondering if we ever get tornadoes 
out here. Now I've never experienced a tornado, but there have been a couple, but not massive ones, just a few small ones. There's actually one near Johannesburg, not so long ago, a couple of months ago, and uh, but they're not prolific like they sort of do occur up in the States, so we're very fortunate that we don't have to worry about that. We really don't even get tsunamis or anything like, down, like that down here in South Africa, just every now and then uh, a bad hurricane, but that's sort of really the absolute worst. And then, of course, you'll hear us complaining about the gale force winds all the time, but you can see Rexon is just down in the distance. So we don't want to get too far away from him, so let's keep up. And we're just going to keep checking the shrubs and things as we go through here to see if we can't find any beetles or caterpillars. Now you're going to see me stopping and walk, walk and stop. Like now, I just thought I heard the rumbling of an elephant. But because it is quite a bit of wind blowing about today, it is muffling sound a substantial amount. So we have to listen very, very carefully. I think though the insects know that there's possibly some rain coming about because they were all on the trees and now they seem to have disappeared. We're going to have to resort to turning over logs. And well, hopefully we come across these elephants and we have a quick glimpse, but no luck just yet. So let's head all the way across to Jamie and see what else she's got planned for you this afternoon. Well, much like Taylor's insects that seem to know that the rain is on its way, the animals of Cheetah Plains seem to, seem to be agreeing with them, and they're all hiding away as well. And that's absolutely fine by me because we're racing away from the storm. I don't want to be get, I don't want to get caught short. Um, the last time I did this on Cheetah Plains, jean and myself basically had to swim home, which I'd prefer to avoid. So we're going to start, we have started racing back in the direction of Juma. However, I have checked the entire southern or most of the southern and then the eastern boundary of cheetah plains and it's very clear to me i found where the cheetah came on um, through cheetah plains and then on they came out of kruger they came onto cheetah plains and then they went south onto mala mala so that tells me that they came from the north i mean obviously i've been on leaves so i've missed out on a little bit of the background behind where the various animals have been and it's always a disconcerting feeling when you've been on leave and you usually have a rough idea of where everything is and then you go away for a few days and everything's changed. But it's pretty clear to me that the cheetahs came from Nkoro side and then moved their way through Kruger onto Mala Mala, which tells me they're probably not going to come back this way just yet. Now that's pretty standard male cheetah territorial walkings and markings and that in particular with our two cheetah brothers we've become very familiar with the path that they walk all the way through cheetah plains through Nkoro Torchwood and then into the uh, reserve called the Manuleti which is north of the Sabi Sand. I think it's safe to say they've gone into Manu uh, Mala Mala and they're not planning on returning just yet. Also found some lion tracks on the eastern boundary chasing buffalo, but the last track I had went into the Kruger National Park. I'm not sure which lions that would be. I'm honestly not sure. It looked as though it was a male, but it was the track was running, so it was quite deep. It might have been a male running into the Kruger chasing buffalo. As to whether or not he was successful, I guess only the Kruger will know. Sure. It's coming. I wonder if this is all going to be a political thunderstorm. If it's all going to be all sound and fury and noise and no actual action. And I think that's exactly what it's shaping up to be. But I'm not going to take that chance as the clouds get closer and closer to us. I'm going to continue my relatively rapid movement to the west and towards Juma. And we were, earlier we were speaking about the different animals and whether or not it is common for them to be killed in thunderstorms. And James is always welcome to the Sunset Safari. He wants to know whether or not it's ever happened that a leopard's been killed in a tree or by a tree uh, whilst sheltering from a storm. Probably. I mean, they've been around for so long and it's such, Africa's such a vast area. It probably has happened. 
but I don't think it happens very often. And we only really, that I suppose they could be up there with a kill. I think leopards are smart enough to know not to go shelter in the tree itself. They tend to go right down to ground, underneath vegetation, underneath bushes rather than big trees. But I'm sure it has happened. I mean, statistics suggest that it must have at some point. One very, very unlucky leopard must have been in the wrong tree at the wrong time. It'd be nice if there was a leopard in a tree now, though. That's just a nice welcome home present. Yes, no, no. I guess that was just wishful thinking. be interesting James but I'm pretty sure yes it probably has happened in the history of the bush it probably has occurred sure these animals are all hiding away I'm gonna go racing through quite a low patch in Cheetah Plains to get back home to Juma so while I do that let's send you back over to Brent so that he can keep you thoroughly entertained Well, welcome back. Now, it's sometimes quite difficult to believe if we look at the sky directly to the north of us, and look at that beautiful blue patchy cloud, but then as soon as we sweep round to the south of us, dark, ominous rain. Still quite far away. But it is coming. Will it reach us? I don't know. We're going to have to ask our resident weather expert, who I hope is in final control listening, Stefan Winterboer. Oh, he's not there. Uh, if he was, I was going to make a joke about how I think he better start filling some sandbags, but alas. Alright, so uh, Final Control has told me that Stefan says it was going to come. Now, forgive me for being a little bit of a pessimist. We have heard this now about five or six times. And uh, we have filled sandbags once so far. But I think, I, I, and I've been wrong as well. I've said, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, everyone to the tent. And no rain. A couple of little drops. So now I'm hoping that those elephants have made their way towards Aubrey's Road. Now, Lionheart is wondering, what does the atmosphere feel like? Uh, what does it smell like? Well, it's still hot. Um, I'd say it's still well, uh, well, still over 90 degrees. Uh, even though the sun isn't on us anymore, it's still really hot, really humid. And it smells quite dusty. I, I haven't got that wonderful smell of rain yet. And uh, so it's still far off that just before the rain comes, the temperature will generally drops a couple of degrees. It's quite pleasing uh, till you start getting wet, of course. But I, I haven't felt that yet. Now, let me just see if we can get a, a view through the gap there. Now, that ridge in the distance. Ooh, lightning. So that ridge, oh, we, can you get a gap through the trees there? So there we go, let me just go forward a little bit. There we go, that ridge in the distance. Ooh, it's about seven or eight k's. And there's no rain there yet. But I just had some lightning right in front of me. So just here. Hello, James Dungan. James would like to know whether we bring in sand for sandbags or do we use what's lying around. Uh, we generally will take a, a team building trip to the Mawati riverbed to collect some river sand from there. The one time we've done it. <laughs> oh. See, it's dark to the west as well. It's going to be interesting to see. I think it's going to be, again, we're sitting in the middle and it's going to go either side of us. Alas.
Now those elephants moved into this block here to the to the left of us and I just want to see if they've maybe made their way all the way through. We might catch them out in the open around uh, Sandy Patch. Lots of tracks on the road. Oh, so Craig, James is wondering, is there any particular animal you would like to see on the drive today? Uh, maybe some leopard? Leopard! Ah, oh, leopard. Yes, I, I would like to see a leopard as well. I haven't seen any tracks on Jumo or Arethusa today, but that doesn't mean they couldn't be hiding in a block somewhere. Now, I am going to go do a gander down towards the west if we have no luck with these elephants, because I'm convinced that shadow is denning in a myriad of little drainage lines there and wouldn't it be absolutely amazing to see her baby or babies for the first time and find her new den site. That's of course in case if we don't get wet but I don't know I don't I'm starting to doubt whether we're going to get wet today. Okay, we're going to keep moving through this area while we do that. Uh, let's go and see what Madam Taylor is up to on foot. You've got to look all the way down through the bushes to have a look and see what we've got. Look at that. We've managed, with the help of Rexon, to find these elephants. Now, I'm not going to talk very loudly because they don't know that we're here. We're behind them. We've got the wind in our favor. Look, 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 there's one crossing the road. You see? Now we're gonna, she's just stand very still because we're out in the open. But luckily for us, elephants don't have the most incredible eyesight. Not like a lion or a leopard does, or even an impala and a zebra has. And because them has got such a big antenna, we'll just stand still and just not move around too much and hopefully at this distance that elephant won't really know what it's looking at. Like I said, we've got the wind in our favor, it can't smell us. The sun is behind clouds, so that's out of play. But it's a youngish elephant. And that's perfect. As he turns his bum, VM, let's move off. The reason why you, when you're walking, it, it's something really to sort of notice is that you use an animal's position to your advantage. So say you're caught out in the open, like we were, as an elephant was crossing the road. You don't want to move around too much because it's going to spot you. At this distance, probably not you. It's going to just move away. It'll probably just look at you, put its trunk up, try and smell you to see what you are. And then as soon as the elephant turned away, we used, now it hasn't got eyes on its bum, thankfully, so we were able to very quickly just slip away and put a couple of small shrubs between us, which will break up the solid of us as a human, which is the thing that the animals are really most scared of. But it's a breeding herd. Now, we don't want to just go marching straight into this very, very dense forest of, of bush willows. I'm looking around me. I don't know how many elephants are here and we keep seeing them crossing the road. So there could still be a satellite party and it's very important to actually look through here and listen to make sure that you don't get in between, well, like I said, either an elephant bull and its breeding herd or a satellite party is the worst thing you could do. But they're very relaxed with us. Yes, they're flapping their ears. It's just because it's an exceptionally hot day. It's starting to cool down a little bit but they still need that additional help, of course, of flapping their ears. And we'll see how this goes. But I don't want to follow them if they're going to go into the very, very dense block. And when you are on a walk, the most important thing that you must remember, that yes, it is fun to try and track the animals, but you have to, you have to be safe all the time. That is the most important thing. You can get nice and close in the vehicles, as you've seen, as we always do, 
and that's perfect but on foot you would never want to be as close to an animal as we get for instance like that elephant bull with Brent this morning I'd be very nervous of if I was standing right next to an elephant like that on foot vehicle completely different story you're in a big thing it moves faster than the animal you can get away when you're on foot you are vulnerable and the idea and I must stress this the idea of a walk is not to focus on the big things it's to focus of course on the smaller things the track and sign that the animals do leave behind but occasionally when we get the opportunity and it is safe we're able to do approaches like this so Rexon says we're going to go towards a termite mound he actually said that there's another elephant coming through let's get a better position though so now what we're going to do is we're going to try and just be as quiet as we can we're going to watch where we put our feet just until we get to this termite mound we're walking here we're putting a big object like the termite mound between us you can feel the wind now we're downwind of the animals again it is swirling a little bit and if you were to climb up onto top, the top of a termite mound like this this would be a very good deterrent if an elephant did charge you it's not going to climb uphill and that's a big termite mound to try and get you okay let's go up are you ready to climb Vim? probably going to be the first time in my life where I'll be taller than an elephant. Oh, come up here, look. Isn't this so cool? I feel like I'm a baboon now. This is a baboon's favorite spot, eh? To sit like this on a termite mount. This is so beautiful because we can see all around us. We're high up. We've got plenty of And of course, elephants are very, very relaxed. And it's moments like these that make the bush so beautiful. It's one thing seeing the animals in a car, however, being able to sit not too far away from them and feed. There's actually another one. Can you see that one coming through the bushes? Just over there. So I'm really glad that we've put ourselves up on this termite mine now because if anyone does come behind her, I'll feel a little less stressed. My goodness, as you see the lightning as well, the lightning is actually surrounding us all over at the moment. Oh, this is beautiful. I don't think we're going to sit here for too much longer. Because the longer you sit in sighting like this, of course, the chances increase that something goes wrong. And I'm not really worried about the elephants. It's the lightning that I've worried about. So we're going to head back towards the open plains. And I'm going to send you back across to Jamie to see what her plans are. way from Taylor on foot right across to the eastern boundary of Juma. Uh, we have returned once again slightly closer to the safety of home just in case this ominous sky does turn out to be or actually is productive in terms of raining and storming. Sorry I saw a roller but it doesn't want to sit still. <laughs> but yes beautiful beautiful afternoon to get back but it is very ominous and I can feel the wind gusting up behind us so we're going to keep heading in the direction of shelter and home just in case we need to beat a hasty retreat to the tent. So far so good though. Our, most of the animals have been hiding away however 
It is wonderful to see now that I'm back once again on Juma. It's wonderful to see just how much the Impala babies have grown. It's astounding. I mean, I've only been away just over a week and already they appear to have doubled in size. And it just goes to show what an efficient job that mother's milk does in providing them with the nutrients that they need to get as big as possible, as quickly as possible. Because the bigger they are, the faster they are, and the, less, the more likely they are to survive. But it never fails to astound me, year in and year out, just how fast those little baby impala grow. I thought I saw some, but they're hiding. Everything appears to be hiding away from us this afternoon. I think it's the wind as well making everything a little bit skittish. Now, trundling along this road brings back wonderful memories of one of my first ever honey badger sightings, where I saw a pair of them. I wasn't, unfortunately, I wasn't doing one of our live safaris. I was just taking a, a, an important guest out on a game drive. And we saw two honey badgers wander straight across the road in front of us. Now, Joshua, you wanted to know on that subject whether or not we have a healthy population of honey badgers on Juma. Yes, as far as we know. And we do see them relatively regularly. Unfortunately, they have a tendency to be far too quick and far too skittish for us to get on camera. But we do see them. I've seen more of them on foot while I've been out tracking than I have from the vehicle itself. But there's definitely quite a few around. And obviously they are creatures that are territorial in a sense, in the sense that they don't really, they're solitary, they don't really tolerate any other honey badgers in their space. And they tend to have quite large home ranges and territories that they occupy for the size of the animal that they are, which means that you don't have, you tend not to have massive concentrations of honey badgers in any particular one place. But we definitely have healthy populations of honey badgers. They're around, we just don't get to see them as often as we would like. And they're such fascinating little creatures. I remember once many years ago when I was still, or I'd just come back to visit where I used to work in the Kalahari, and they were raising a honey badger that they'd very imaginatively named Badger. Um, by hand. His mother had been hit by a car and he'd been caught and, and rescued and was being hand raised but hand raised in a way that he would he would then go on to be released into the wild and he was successfully released into the wild and lives quite happily there to this day but it was fascinating watching the whole process uh, teaching him to eat things like birds, to eat his normal natural diet and then they'd take him out for walks it's the strangest, strangest experience walking a honey badger. Strange and slightly terrifying because he used to chase me and then snap at my ankles and they're not very fast. So it's not as though I was ever under any threat of being caught, but he just had such a look of dogged determination as he raced down the road after me. Here's a bird. That is going to sit. It's one of my favorite. B Aww. You horrible bird. One of my favorite birds, but it flew away. It was an emerald spotted wood dove. Which, to take us back to the honey badger, would definitely be on its menu. Our badger went on to live a very happy and healthy life, living wild. Uh, he came back to visit every now and again. He came back to visit the people that raised him. They, he was given a wide berth though, because as you know, honey badgers have a fearsome reputation and it is a well-earned reputation. So he came back to visit on one memorable occasion. He brought his lady friend to visit as well. He was obviously in the process of courting her. And as far as I know, he lives happily and healthily to this day in, in the Kalahari Desert somewhere. But the first time I ever played with him, he was about six months old and he left semicircle bruises all the way along my arms. It was an interesting experience and I remember falling totally and utterly in love with him and the idea of a honey badger from that moment on. Ah, oh, we've been speaking a lot about the dramatic skies that this afternoon has to offer. Let's head over to Brent so that he can provide you with a different view.